All right, good morning, everyone. I hope you're all having a wonderful start to your week. My name is Amrita, and I'm an APPI student here to present an overview on Suboxone. Many thanks to my preceptor, Heather Stewerwald, for all her support. So without further ado, I'll get started. Here are my objectives. Um, I would like to define and outline the characteristics of buprenorphine, which allows it to be an effective OUD, opioid use disorder agent. Identify and recognizes, recognize the changes being made to the X waiver and how this can impact future pharmacist practice. And then compare and contrast the differences between outpatient and inpatient initiation of buprenorphine products like Suboxone. So let's talk about the opioid use disorder epidemiology. Uh, we have 2.4 million Americans with um, OUD, according to the US Department of Health and Human Services. Of that population, only 1.27 million Americans have been initiated on MAT, or medication-assisted therapy, including drugs like methadone, buprenorphine, or naltrexone. Since the year 1999, over 760,000 Americans have died due to drug overdose, which could have been prevented with adequate MAT therapy. The good news is that there has been an increase in data providers, data meaning Drug Addiction Treatment Act of 2000, who can offer buprenorphine treatment um, for the benefit of patients. So we're moving in the right direction. So that leads me to a little overview about the products being used for OUD. Um, Buprenorphine is a more recent introduction to the OUD space as it was approved in 2002 for the treatment of opioid use disorder. This is a Schedule three opioid analgesic with fewer drug-drug interactions than other OUD products and opioids. No specific clinic is required to obtain the buprenorphine. Methadone, on the other hand, has been around a lot longer than the buprenorphine. It is a Schedule two drug that is prescribed through a regulated methadone clinic. Given its long half-life, dosing and titrations can become complicated, and there can be an increased risk of prolonging the QT interval and potential respiratory depression, especially during the initiation phase and during the dose titrations of methadone. More on that soon, but methadone can be a little more complicated. So that leads me to the star of the day, Suboxone. Um, suboxone is a combination of buprenorphine and naloxone, which can come as a sublingual film or tablet. The UW Health formulary supplies it as a sublingual film, and it is an analgesic and a partial opioid agonist. So that leads us to the first question, what is buprenorphine? To provide some background, this is a partial opioid agonist um, as it act partially activates the mu receptors, even when fully binding to the receptors, used for pain and OUD treatment. It is derived from the opium alkaloid thebane of the papaversoniferum poppy. It has many chiral centers and a morphine backbone. It is interesting to note that its effects are more defined in the lower CNS as opposed to the upper CNS. Animal studies from the Ding et al. study indicated that a spinal injection of naloxone an opioid antagonist, blocked analgesia of buprenorphine, but subspinal injection of naloxone did not block the buprenorphine analgesic properties. So decreased upper CNS effects is hypothesized um, to limit its uh, euphoria, addiction, and respiratory uh, depression effects. Buprenorphine also interacts with the mu, delta, kappa, and opioid receptor-like one receptors. Uh, the mu opioid receptor is a G protein coupled receptor that controls pain relief, respiratory depression, euphoria, and constipation. Buprenorphine, as a partial agonist, cannot activate the receptor fully, uh, leading to less uh, ad severe ad adverse effects than we see with methadone. And here's a little more interest information about that. When buprenorphine binds to the mu receptors, it has limited downstream beta arrestin recruitment, unlike the other ligands. And beta arrestin plays an important role in activating more of the negative opioid effects, such as constipation and respiratory depression. Buprenorphine overall has a low equilibrium dissociation constant, or KI, uh, translating to a high binding affinity at the mu receptor and compared to the other opioids. 
And on the chart that you see at the left is from Uden et al. And you will see that buprenorphine has an equilibrium constant of 0 0.22, while drugs like codeine have a binding of up to 734. Though buprenorphine has a strong binding ability, it does not equate to high activity as it is a partial opioid agonist. Um, it does have slower dissociation from receptors, leading to longer dur duration of the analgesia and potentially less um, withdrawal for the pain. Buprenorphine overall has high lipophilicity, promoting large volume of distribution and increased bioavailability. It has a half-life of 24 to 60 hours and has biphasic distribution. Overall, sublingual and buccal uh, forms of administration are more effective, but first pass metabolism restricts oral bioavailability, which is why it's really given sublingually and buccally. So just a visual description of buprenorphine's uh, partial effect, as it is a partial agonist nature, it does, um, it does have a ceiling effect leading to decreased negative consequences such as respiratory depression and the euphoric effects, making it a better option for patients um, in OUD. So that leads us to the next question, what is naloxone? It is an opioid receptor antagonist, and it reverses the res can potentially reverse the respiratory depression from opioid overdose. This has a half-life of 30 to 40 minutes. So notice that this is a lot shorter than the buprenorphine. So the question is, why is an antagonist combined with a partial agonist for uh, OUD treatment? Well, it's important to understand that there's a theoretical outplay and then what you see in the real world. In theory, if suboxone is taken as it should, sublingually, buprenorphine is absorbed well, about 33 to 55% absorption, but naloxone is not absorbed well uh, due to hepatic first pass metabolism. Um, if sublingual suboxone, however, were crushed and to, used in an IV form, naloxone has a stronger effect and blocks receptors, preventing the benefits of an illicit use of buprenorphine. However, what we see play out in the real world is that buprenorphine has almost a 10 times greater mu binding affinity than naloxone. Buprenorphine, as discussed earlier, also slowly dissociates from the receptors. So buprenorphine sometimes overtakes the effect of naloxone. Furthermore, naloxone's effect is usually temporary and it might delay the pleasure uh, inducing onset of buprenorphine. But nonetheless, our reports have shown reduction in parenteral abuse with the combo product. And this could be a result uh, of the education from providers that naloxone prevents misuse. Now let's discuss the FDA approved buprenorphine products for OUD treatment. We see a couple of products here. There are sublingual films, sublingual tablets, implants, and injections. But we wanted to reiterate that oral absorption is poor due to first pass metabolism. The transdermal is also poor, but the sublingual is effective as it bypasses first pass metabolism and buccal is most efficient with the highest bioavailability. Here on the UW formulary, we have uh, suboxone in the form of sublingual films with the following dosing schemes, um, but sublingual tablets are not on the formulary. So that leads us to the question, how do we interchange between buprenorphine products? So if we're moving, transitioning from just uh, a single buprenorphine to a combo product, the suboxone, the buprenorphine plus naloxone, um, the sublingual uh, products are comparable and um, the decision is ultimately something that should be taken place between the provider and the patient. But if sublingual suboxone tablets is being switched to a subli uh, sublingual suboxone film, we A, don't repeat the induction. And then it's important to note that um, the sublingual uh, suboxone film, uh, specifically the 2 milligram, uh, 0.5 milligram, and the 4 milligram, 1 milligram tablets and films have a relatively similar bioavailability, but with higher dosing schemes, the film has more bioavailability than the tablet. So overall, it would be reasonable to start out on an equivalent dose and then monitor for over or under dosing. So now that leads us to the next important topic, the X waiver. 
The Data 2000, CARA, and Support Acts all allow for dispensing and prescription of buprenorphine outside of specific OTP, or opioid treatment programs, uh, specifically, MDs, DOs, nurse practitioners, certified nurse, uh, registered nurse anesthetists, and certified nurse midwives can prescribe uh, buprenorphine. MDs and DOs would only require an eight-hour training, uh, only if they're managing greater than 30 patients a year. Uh, the remaining practitioners would require a 24-hour training. It's important to note that there is an NOI, Notice of Intent Submission, that's required for MDs and DOs who are treating less than 30 patients. And this is uh, also provides an exception, exemption from the requirements for training, counseling, and psychosocial services. It's important to note that there is an exception for medical emergencies known as the three-day rule. Uh, this is an exception only to administer, not prescribe or dispense by providers who don't have an X waiver or an NOI, but more on this soon. Then I wanted to provide some fresh news that's pretty exciting. Um, to expand access to buprenorphine, the House passed the X waiver elimination, but this is yet to pass through the Senate. Uh, through this change, pharmacists could also become eligible to order medications for OUD treatment, which is certainly exciting news. Uh, now I'll be going over some important information about outpatient um, suboxone use. Uh, when you initiate a patient on buprenorphine products, when the patient you do that when the patient is actively in withdrawal. Through, then during the induction phase, a COWS or clinical opiate withdrawal scale score is determined. And based on that scoring, an initial dose is administered for which the patient is observed for two hours. You would initiate a patient on buprenorphine at least six to 12 hours post heroin use. Uh, if the patient was previously on methadone, ensure that the patient has been tapered down to less than 40 milligrams of a dose and initiate 24 hours post the last methadone dose. Uh, to switch over to Suboxone, uh, after starting on just buprenorphine, it's best to wait three days. But overall, I guess some important points to note is uh, this is certainly not a PRN medication. It needs to be scheduled to help uh, patients be treated throughout the day. And then the duration of the treatment is ultimately a decision made by the provider and the patient. Now to talk about the inpatient use of buprenorphine. Uh, this ties in with the exemption that we talked about earlier. So let's say we have a patient arriving at the ED and it looks like they are requiring uh, OUD treatment. Here, prescribers could administer buprenorphine. And here's a reminder about the three-day rule. Uh, the patient would have to come in each day to get their dose because uh, the provider, if they didn't have an X waiver or NOI, would not be able to dispense uh, the buprenorphine. Now for perioperative OUD treatment, the NAM, or the National Academy of Medicine, calls for enhanced collaboration between providers from pain, surgery, and anesthesiology on this issue. The literature shows that there are unfortunately increased number of deaths in OUD patients post-surgery for risks of overdosing and inappropriate pain management. So the older initial guidelines directed providers to terminate buprenorphine during the post-operative period due to the concern that buprenorphine receptors would be filled up, the new receptors would be filled up, preventing uh, full opioid agonists from effectively treating the pain. But the later research showed that typically new receptors are still available and full agonist doses can be increased um, to better treat a patient's uh, post-operative pain. But it is possible that the analgesia requirements may be lowered in the first place, given buprenorphine is an analgesic by itself. Uh, buprenorphine can also has been shown to reduce the risk of overdosing as it occupies new receptors in this patient population. Ultimately, it's important to do an appropriate discharge handoff to an appropriate outpatient provider who can monitor the patient's um, OUD medication therapy. So I wanted to talk about some um, major side effects of the of buprenorphine medication itself. 
Uh, three big ones that really stand out are tooth decay, hypotension, and constipation. And I really want to hone in on tooth decay. Uh, this was a special alert that came out uh, as of January of 2022 from the FDA, uh, indicating that dental decay, cavities, and tooth loss, tooth loss has been reported. Some hypothesize that this could be because uh, suboxone could lead to um, decreased saliva production and that suboxone in and of itself is acidic in nature with a pH of 3.4. Um, it is important to note here that the administration of the sublingual film is about four to eight minutes under the tongue, which can contribute to an increased oral exposure time. Nonetheless, uh, no clear reason has been properly established about why uh, suboxone is le or buprenorphine is leading to the enhanced tooth decay. So overall, it's a good idea to educate patients about the following. After the medication dissolves, it's important to take a large sip of water and swish around the mouth and the gums. It's important to wait one hour to brush the teeth. And it's uh, important to uh, notify the dentist and um, visit them regularly. So with that being said, here are my references and I am open to any questions. Thank you.